take your time and really look at what your base is right now. Take a look at your audience right now. Take a look at what your original mission was. Has it changed? Should it be changed? And then look and see what your resources are. Hi, Marta folks. This is Alina. Today with me, I have Lauren Lattimore of Fractured Atlas. Lauren is a very special guest because she will share uh, very, very profound insights about the life um, of artists in 2021 in the post-lockdown period. Uh, she will share information about Fractured Atlas. It is an organization that provides a ton of services for the contemporary artists, including fiscal sponsorship, help with artist visas, um, a fundraising platform, right? Just launched something very new and a lot of other things. Hi, Lauren, and thank you so much for your time today for this interview. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm, I feel honored. <laughs> I'm honored. It's me who is honored. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Lauren, my first question to you, just for those who have no clue what Fractured Atlas is, what actually fiscal sponsorship is, would you please just uh, explain this in a few sentences, maybe, what is exactly fiscal sponsorship and why an artist or a group or a team of artists working together should, in fact, apply for one and what is it going to bring to their professional career? Yes, so Fractured Atlas, we're a nonprofit arts organization. We've been around since 1998, uh, believe it or not. And we have always had the mission to help um, individual artists and arts, organiz arts organizations in general to break different barriers that they often face when it comes to fundraising. Uh, right now, we have our fiscal sponsorship program that is our longest program and most robust uh, program. We sponsor currently over 4,000 artists um, nationwide. Some of them are international as well. Um, and we help them mainly again with their fundraising needs. So because we are a 501c3 status, fiscal sponsorship is essentially sharing some of the benefits of that 501c3 status with artists individually, or arts organizations, let's say there's a group of artists, maybe there's a theater company that mm -hmm. they don't have that 501c3 status. So we're sharing ours with them so they can have access to things that they normally wouldn't, like being able to provide a donation receipt to their donors who contribute to their project for their expenses or applying for grants, which here in the States, uh, we have a lot of uh, state funding or government funding or sometimes uh, foundations or big institutions they want to make sure that they're actually getting a donation receipt so it has to be to another charitable organization right. if they grant artistic projects so that's where we come in and we help them by you know supporting them and giving them whatever they need so they can apply for these grants. We also offer um, a crowdfunding platform to our fiscally sponsored projects where it's the same thing. I'm sure you have heard of, um, I don't, do they have GoFundMe in Austria? Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> I think so. I think it's international. Uh, like crowdfunding campaign, like a big crowdfunding campaign. Yeah, there's Indiegogo. I'm, I'm glad you said Indiegogo. We actually um, used to be partnered with Indiegogo years ago. Oh. And then we created our own crowdfunding platform. Mm -hmm. And so this was because we wanted to offer donation receipts to donors who contributed to our projects. As far as we know, we are the only ones who have a platform where they can get donation receipts for their contributions. Other platforms, just you raise the money and that is it. But we can actually offer donors, you know, that uh, receipt in return. So that's a, that's a big driving force. And also with fiscal sponsorship, projects are able to get rentals, uh, discounts that normally they wouldn't have access to. So like for costumes 
or for uh, venue spaces when every, well, everything is starting to open up back now, mm -hmm. but things like that we offer to 501c3s. We also assist by, you know, saying they're sponsored under us. We're the 501c3, here's our information. Mm -hmm. So, so 501c3 over... is a non nonprofit organization for, for those who are not familiar with the American way of um, naming the organizations that there is a nonprofit uh, in the German speaking Europe, it's called Verein. So this is pretty much the same thing. It's an organization to which the donations can be made that will be tax deductible. So that's why providing receipts is very important. Yes, charitable contributions are huge. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you uh, said that there are international artists as well as the US based ones. So one does not have to have a US residence in order to apply for a fiscal sponsorship at Fractured Atlas. Is that correct? So, yes. so there's a little bit of um, just technically speaking, because there is the charitable um, donation receipt component, mm -hmm. there is a um, that we do need to whoever the project is we must have some some u.s tax id mm -hmm. and some u.s address on file for the project and that can be anyone so let's say um even if it's you know molly she wants to she's in another country um but she also she doesn't have u.s status but she wants to use our fiscal sponsorship but she has partners or family in the states we would still we she would more than likely use a, a US address from maybe her partner or co-collaborator mm -hmm. or someone from the state so we can have that. And then, you know, whoever her collabor her US collaborator is, use their tax ID. Um, so we can't just solely, if you don't have either, we cannot fiscally sponsor you because our government, our tax regulation, the IRS, we have to issue um, tax paperwork to these artists after they get a certain amount of donations mm -hmm. from us throughout their sponsorship and they have to get taxed on that so that is the shortest way i can explain <laughs> right but pretty much then it would be another person applying for the sponsorship if if the person who wants to apply doesn't have any ties to the us for example then the, they would have to have another person or um, so it, it would still be their project because uh -huh. members Yes. So okay. in order to apply for fiscal sponsorship, you must first become a member. Mm -hmm. And once you become a member, a dues paying member, paying either uh, our professional level, which means one user on the account, mm -hmm. or our organizational level, meaning a minimum of three users on the account, that could be the person in the other country they can still put another tax id on their application but they would still be the primary account holder oh great oh. yeah yes. that looks like a really good way around <laughs> excellent yeah. um okay my next question is whether the donations can theoretically be made from outside of the US and uh, whether they would be tax deductible in this case or it applies only to the US based donations? Excellent question. We actually get this a lot. So the thing is, we can we can only process donations, obviously, in, in US currency, but mm -hmm. we have gotten wires or if a um, international donor is using their credit card, you know, um, mm -hmm. and they make the donation to the projects page online. We can process that and we will still email them their donation receipt. The only thing is um, we just strongly suggest that they speak to their tax advisor in their country to see if, if our donation receipt will suffice for of their write-off need. Okay, yeah. that's really, really great to hear. Um, I wanted to ask you about the grant programs. Um, I don't want to call it database because I probably made a mistake uh, asking you in the email, but the a blog category that um, covers the grants. So yeah. Fractured Atlas provides a, a category in the blog and we'll provide the links below in the description. So you can browse uh, different grants that are there 
And I just wanted to talk to you about what kinds of grants are covered in this category of your blog. Yes, yeah, so um, every month we do our grants uh, blog post. And so it's basically the upcoming grants for it within the following in the next month, in the next mm -hmm. 30 days. So these are just, at this point, since we've been around, we either get funders who send us like heads up, like we've got this grant that we're offering. You might want to share this with your artist. Um, or uh, we have a wonderful uh, content creator. Her name is Nina. She's the one who writes the blog posts. She's, it's her job too, to also research and um, find maybe upcoming grants. So some things we automatically know are coming around. They're like annual grants that usually drop during a certain time. Sometimes the funder contacts us or um, our content editor, she, she finds them and we just share them. It, they go out, we do an e-blast to all of our projects and it's just a heads up. It's just an alert. These are US-based grants. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And just maybe a couple of sentences on your grant policy, please. I mean, I've, I've done it myself personally, but it would be great if you will be the one uh, specifying um, how many weeks in advance one needs to apply to Fracture Atlas with a grant application in order to review and all these things. Sure. So this is the uh, this is the, the busy work um, our project our projects love or hate. Um, so when you become new a newly fiscally sponsored project, and I'll just explain to you just what that is. So after you become the member, apply for fiscal sponsorship. Everything is online. It takes one to two weeks for your application to be either approved by our board. Once you get the approval applications and you're fiscally sponsored, usually projects later on down the line or sometimes even at the beginning, they say, I want to start applying for grants. We have a $1,000 eligibility requirement before any project can apply for grants. The reason why we have this is because over the years, foundations or various different funders uh, had specified and kind of showed interest in projects who at least had other donors outside of themselves showing interest in their work. And we were noticing that some of our projects that didn't quite have any uh, donation history, because a lot of times on the app, grant applications, they ask who's invested in your work prior to us, they, they'd had nothing. So we said, okay, based off of the feedback that we were getting from funders, we're going to make it a requirement so we know that any project that we send out has at least raised $1,000 or more in, you know, contributions. Mm -hmm. And I say that, say, um, contribution is the key word, not earned revenue, meaning ticket sales or merchandise sales. Mm -hmm. It has to be um, contributed revenue, mm -hmm. donation. Important. Yeah. So it can be in crowdfunding return. or grants or any type of a non-revenue um, income. Exactly. Yes, you are dead on. So crowdfunding, um, it could be individual donations that they received through us. Like, at, let's mm -hmm. say they've been, you know, fiscally sponsored by us for the past month or so. And they've had friends and family oh. donating to their page. Good and point. we say, oh, well, they've already. They've already, yeah, so that already counts. We don't even ask them about eligibility because we can see that they've raised it or they can show us maybe they've gotten a small local grant that didn't need a 501c3 or status or nonprofit mm -hmm. status. Mm -hmm. And the last time before they became fiscally sponsored, we just ask, can we see the award letter? And we waive that eligibility oh, great. requirement for them. Okay. Yes. So then once we waive it, <laughs> yes. Yes. So once we waive that, and usually it's not a big deal, but it is, it is um, our policy. So once we waive mm -hmm. it, a project will then have to tell us 10 days, 10 business days ahead of the grant due date that they're applying for this grant. They have to submit all of their materials to us. So this is through email. They have to, so if it's an online portal, grant portal, where they logged in and created a username, password, and filled out an online application and saved it, they would send us those that login information. And then we would go in and we have 10, essentially two weeks 
to go in, review it, upload any documents, nonprofit documents that we have to uh, send mm -hmm. to them. We'll give them feedback. Uh, we, we don't do grant writing or like grammatical um, updates, but if we see that a, a question could be stronger, or a response could be stronger, or we're very familiar with this foundation and we say, okay, we know what they like, we'll give feedback within those 10 business days. That's very helpful. I've gotten that. And um, yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, excellent. So, so pretty much um, to summarize again, the benefit, one of the main benefits of the fiscal sponsorship is an opportunity to apply to grants that are only made for the nonprofit to which the individual artist, let's say, cannot apply. One of the main things, because you can theoretically apply to all the other grants that allow individuals to apply directly, but of course you can't uh, apply to the grants that are made for nonprofits. And, and in fact, they are, I believe they are made for nonprofits just to make the paperwork more transparent usually. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I agree with you. So transparency and mainly because they can't get the write-offs for the, mm -hmm. so whenever a foundation donates, if they donate it to an individual without a status, they can't get the write-off. And, and imagine they're donating 10, 5, 10, 20, 000, you know, big right. thousands and thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. And it, it can't be perceived by our government as a charitable contribution unless it's going to a charitable nonprofit. So it's, it's got to meet the, the nonprofit world has to work. If another, if anyone is making a charitable contribution, an individual without the status cannot give them a receipt. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they don't, they don't have a write off. And these, they want, they essentially want, the, they need the write off. Of course. In order for it to be. Yes. Uh, so if you are looking to apply for funding that is only available to nonprofit organization, consider applying to Fracture Atlas for a fiscal sponsorship. <laughs> um, Lauren, my next uh, few questions are about the artist visas. Uh, mm -hmm. I have seen on the website that there is a service for the artist uh, to, to help to get a visa if somebody wants to come and work in the US. And my question was whether uh, Fractured Atlas actually issues the official invitations or it acts as an intermediary and someone else is supposed to issue the invitation. Would you please uh, explain a bit more about this? Good question. So what happens here? So the, our visa program is like our second biggest program outside of the fiscal sponsorship. And I've always thought it was fascinating too, because I knew nothing about artist visas before I um, came to Fractured Atlas. I've been here now for five years. And it was the first time I had learned myself <laughs> about um, this whole process. So what it is, is we are a small part of the visa pr a process. Mm -hmm. um, essentially what we do is we offer consultation letters for the, uh, the United States Citizen uh, Immigration Services to review and pretty much vouch for them, vouch for the artists that is mm -hmm. coming over. And we're saying, yes, they, their credentials check out, we've reviewed their resume, we've reviewed their portfolios. Um, we've looked at their employer, who's uh, usually the employer is the petitioner. Um, so we reviewed all this information. We reviewed their legal information. And as a certified uh, service, we can, who is registered, who's able to, to approve this, we say, yes, they are artists of extraordinary talent. Yes, they're going to a viable campaign or a, vi a viable employer. Yes, they're best fit for this. Mm -hmm and clear them. So it's really just, we provide the consultation letter and we give that to either the artist's lawyer. Sometimes they, they have uh, lawyers that they, that are applying on their behalf for them. Sometimes it's the employer, which let's say if you are a fashion designer mm -hmm. and 
Givenchy wants you over, you know, here in the U.S. state, you know, and so sometimes it's the employer, Givenchy is the petitioner, and they're vouching for this artist. They're saying, we want to bring this artist over. We need this letter to give to the Immigration Services Department. We look at everything and we say, okay. And then we, and we give them our seal of approval. We give them the official documents mm -hmm. and then the petitioner or the lawyer then files it. Oh, that's a great service. I'm sure it's going to be useful for a lot of artists who want to come and work in the US, especially after the lockdown when the borders are slowly opening up and fingers crossed, it's going to stay like this <laughs> and get only better <laughs> from now on. Um, could you please uh, share a few sentences about the Creative Outpost? I believe that's a new service, right? It's, uh, it's a place to share uh, and engage and learn about uh, various artistic activities. And actually, I haven't even had the chance to look at it because it's so new. Uh, so maybe you can just uh, give more info about it. No problem. Yes, it's so new. I Even myself, I'm trying to keep up with it. <laughs> we just rolled it out in April. So what is it? May, June, June. So, right. So it's yep. not even really 90 days old or wow. maybe just reached three months. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we've only taken on, I mean, there's only 100 projects on there, 100 artists on there right now. So we're not even full capacity. Mm -hmm. But um, essentially, <laughs> Creative Outpost is an online platform where artists can log in. We're using a, uh, we didn't build our own platform for this. We're, we're partnered with Mighty Works. And essentially, that can be that you can download the app or um, you can go on their website and set up an account. It's called, I'm sorry, Mighty Networks. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially you'll you'll see you'll see us you'll see the Fr fractured atlas creative outposts and it's just a place where if you have a job let's say you're a theater company and you're hiring dancers or you you can post your job listings on there mm -hmm. there are rooms or pockets or boards where uh you can have creative talks and and host like a talk about how our new york city artists now finding rehearsal space or you know, someone in a different state that has that, or somebody in a different country. How are international artists uh, collaborating and meeting with these type of designers? You can create your own hub to do what you want and crowdsource with different people. So it's just a way for artists to collaborate and just share all of their information, whether it be job listings, discussions. Wonderful, and it is international as you mentioned so so it yes. is quite worldwide it's really great uh our goal is for it to be open because we only have 100 members right now mm -hmm. um that are active we have a wait list once we it fully launches it should be then open we're working on that but right now it is only um u.s based primarily mm -hmm. check it out everyone who is interested in the artistic immersion at Fractured Atlas. The last uh, question, not even a question, but if you have any tips and advice on the post lockdown period for artists on running and managing their artistic career, on fundraising, networking, do's and don'ts, would you please share your intake on this? Very good question. Um, we're still I think the world is still trying to figure out like what's going to stick and what is not. Um, a lot of artists found, actually, they found themselves in a better place doing virtual shows. Some things translated better than others um, in terms of the virtual world and doing that. So I I think some projects, and I think they've reached, I know we've seen projects reach greater audiences because everything was virtual so they could share the links and more people. So they got a different mm -hmm. donor base. So I think at this point, projects are learning, okay, how can we still keep these, these, this chunk of an audience engaged and we don't want to lose this new audience, but we also want to, you know, go back to our, 
our original group or original audience and serve them and, and be back in live space. So that is really the tug of war. And then where are you getting this money to do both? Because now, okay, all the money used to go towards venues, renting venue rentals mm -hmm. or, you know, space but now the expenses change now we're investing in a producer you know an editor or some type of tech person to help them do a better zoom version of a show mm -hmm. or a better uh, you know virtual live stream uh, so much has gone into the tech part so it's like can we keep that going keep paying the tech person for the live component and then also now pay everything for the for the live show so I would say what we're telling projects is take your time and really look at what your base is right now. Look at what your mission is, what your mission and what your purpose was pre-pandemic may not be the same anymore. Um, the community that you're trying to serve may have other needs and so what that show or that story that you were trying to tell you might need to revamp and pivot to something else um a lot of projects had to do that and say you know what i have this mission to tell the story about this historic figure doing x y and z but we're in the middle of the pandemic and now this is the focal point and maybe this isn't relevant right now um so that was that was a hard look uh, for a lot of uh, projects, but I would say, take a look at your audience right now. Take a look at what your original mission was. Has it changed? Should it be changed? And then look and see what your resources are. How much do you still have, have say, if you have anything left or saved in your, you know, account for, to create this work, to produce this work? What does fundraising look like for you now? Are your donors still the same? Uh, because so many uh, people have lost their jobs. Um, some some people have moved. A lot of a lot of mitigating factors determine how one should move forward. But they're hard questions. But once you get past them, that'll give you a clearer focus on how to move forward. A lot of our projects are afraid to fundraise because they're saying, "Well, everybody lost their jobs," or "I don't want to." I don't want to reach out to a family member or I don't want to touch, you know, my friends and family or ask them for any charitable contribution. How dare I? And what I and what we noticed was during the pandemic is that ultimately people are going to contribute where they're going to contribute. Whether they have it or not, they're going to do it or they're not. And during this time, People sought an escape and they sought art. They wanted something to take them away from the current situation. And a lot of um, projects were successful in still getting a healthy amount of donations because if they're your core group of fans or audience, they're, they want to see you and they want to see you do well. So they contributed no matter what. Some the donations may have been smaller than what it was prior to, but they still contributed. And they needed that. They wanted a sense of familiarity. Because our worlds got so turned around and it was this kind of like new normal. So having some of the vices and comforts of your favorite show or your favorite musician, being able to see that, people still support it. So we say, don't be afraid of it, but just ask yourself the hard questions first so it makes sense when you do go out and fundraise again for your new work. Wow. <laughs> Lauren, thank you so much for this powerful insight and just a magical punch. <laughs> so everyone who had doubts, now Lauren told you to just go create, fundraise, and present your projects and I can only succumb to that. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I am so inspired now myself. <laughs> oh, <I'm glad>. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go work on my own projects and, and filing the documents for fundraising for, for foundations and stuff. Yeah. And so really, really thank you for, from the bottom of my heart for sharing 
these tips and the information on what Fractured Atlas does and what kinds of services it offers. I'm sure it was helpful to many, many emerging artists and mature artists out there. And feel free to contact Fractured Atlas if you have questions and browse the web pages and services. I will provide the links below in the description. Yeah, thanks again, Lauren. And subscribe to this channel if you found this video useful and interesting. Hit the thumbs up. I'll see you in the next video. And in the meantime, keep creating, stay healthy, and take care of yourself. Bye, everyone. Bye.